Hello, hello, it is Charmaine Hammond, and I'm here with Joanna Severino for Prep Online, one of our webinar, they're actually Wednesday webinars that we've been doing since April. And this has been a wonderful opportunity to bring together parents and students and educators, organizations that work with students and families, and of course, guidance counselors and athletic directors to talk about some of the topics that are really important and top of mind right now for students and families. And today's topic is going to be an exciting one. I've been getting questions through LinkedIn. I've po been posting some of them on social media because the questions are rolling in about virtual volunteering and how does that support private school applications and college and university applications. And of course, how do we get students and families involved in volunteering when we're living in a world right now where physical distancing is making it very difficult to actually go to organizations. And then of course, we'll also be talking about gap years and learning what those are, what does one do on a gap year? What opportunities available? And any questions that you have for our viewing audience that's with us live today, you can pop those in the chat room and we will see the questions and we'll, we'll deal with those as we go through the content. And of course, you can also use the Q&A box. So Joanna, should we uh, put up our slides and, and tell a little bit more about who our guests are today? You ready to rock Absolutely. and roll? Absolutely. Looking Excellent. forward to it. Me too. This is a great time to be talking about this topic while we've got graduations going on. And Shane, you had made some really interesting comments just before we went live about this year being an exceptionally uh, memorable year for students. So when we get into the content, I'm going to get you to repeat what you, what you said a few minutes ago. All right, so I am Charmaine Hammond. I've worked in the education sector for many, many years, providing training and facilitation to educators, to teachers, and also providing programs to students. And I also do a lot of work in the area of resilience and helping organizations work better together. And I'm just delighted to be a co-host on this topic. One of, the, one of the things that gives me joy is learning from other people. And Joanne has invited me to be a co-host with her on this series. And it's like going back to school every Wednesday, Joanna. And Joanna Severino is the founder, the president of Prep Skills and US College Expo. She's been in the education sector for a long time, more than 25 years and works with private schools, with families, with guidance counselors, with US colleges, and is passionate, deeply, deeply passionate about helping students find their future. And Joanna, did you just wanna say a couple of words about uh, prep skills? Sure, so I, I've been an educator for over 25 years, a mother of uh, three lovely boys, ages 14, 11, and eight. And uh, we primarily work with families who are, as you said, Charmaine, transitioning. So those who are transitioning from middle school to high school and high school to post-secondary. So we're really passionate about connecting students to educational options and, and, as you said, helping them find their future. Wonderful. Thank you. And these two outstanding guests that I've been so excited to meet. I know that Joanna has met Shane before because Shane presented at uh, US College Expo and it's a delight to also meet Michelle. Um, these two guests have incredible value to offer and I'm gonna introduce both of them and then we're going to dive in. So let me start with Shane Feldman uh, and his organization is called Count Me In. He's the founder and the CEO of Count Me In and is the visionary behind the world's largest, that's right, the world's largest student-led movement. Over the past decade, Count Me In has initiated tens of thousands of projects right around the world, contributing a value of over $2.6 billion to the global economy through service. And Shane has been featured by Larry King, Dr. Oz, Forbes, People Magazine, and his documentary series, TV series for A&E follows the work that he's been doing mentoring teens. He's a globally celebrated youth empowerment expert. Shane has spoken to audiences around the world, has been recognized by the White House, the United Nations, and we're thrilled to have him with us today. Welcome, Shane. Uh, such a pleasure and honor to be with you, Charmaine. 
Oh, thank you. And Michelle Dittmer, I am so excited about learning all about gap years. This is new learning for me. And Michelle, uh, recognizing that students were not being provided with enough opportunity to get that hands-on experience to develop life skills, Michelle left the classroom to explore other ways of helping young people and students find their direction and fulfillment. She worked to train other teachers. She instructed outdoor education. She traveled for pleasure and for work and researched what today's youth really want and really need. All of her life experience drove her to the same conclusion. And that was that we need to slow down and give young people the space and the time to figure out who they are and engage them in meaningful experiences. She founded the Canadian Gap Year Association as an antidote to business, mental health challenges, and young adults feeling confused and unfulfilled. She has committed her professional life to giving families permission to slow down, boy, do we need that now, to slow down so that their kids can be the best version of themselves and make healthy transitions into adulthood. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me. All right, well, I think we should dive into this conversation because we have many, many questions for you. So I wanted to start off today's uh, conversation with a quote uh, that I heard that really uh, spoke to me about today's topic, and then a couple of really profound um, statistics that I learned about volunteerism. So I'm going to quote an uh, education influencer in Alberta, Canada, by the name of George Carose, and he says, engagement is what you can do for your students. Engagement is what you can do for your students. Empowerment is what your students can do for themselves. And both Shane and Michelle and Joanna all work in this area of empowering youth and helping youth find their direction and become leaders. So thank you, George, for that quote that we could share today. And one of the stats that I discovered, and this is Canadian, was that volunteer.ca, which by the way, for all of you looking for virtual volunteerism opportunities, that is a great website. It lists uh, province by province, community by community. But put your seatbelts on for this statistic. 75,000 volunteer opportunities across Canada have been registered. <laughs> That's a lot of opportunity, wouldn't you say? <laughs> so, so let's start learning about how do we find out about these opportunities, what are gap years, and lots more. So Joanne, I'm going to pass it over to you to kick off our, our questions. Well, thank you. And thanks, Michelle and Shane, for the positive social impact that you've had. Um, I wanted to start by maybe talking about volunteerism. How important is that for students who are applying to post-secondary institutions? And how can we, you know, help them support uh, virtual volunteering opportunities? Shane? Right now, I'd say more than ever before, private schools, Ivy League schools, and really most college universities, they're looking for the most well-rounded students possible. And in some ways that's always been the case, but now more than ever, that points to two very clear factors. It points to soft skills that students are learning and what they're doing outside of academics and extracurriculars. And I'd say for many students, that also includes outside of sports because sports in many ways are part of curriculum right now. Uh, so you wanna think about things that you're doing in the community, whether it's volunteering, whether it's an internship, things that are gonna help you build those soft skills, uh, things like confidence, self-esteem, the ability to work well with others and collaborate. We live in this world today where knowledge is at our fingertips. Mr. Google has everything you could possibly want to know, but it doesn't mean you know how to apply that or implement it. So what universities and colleges and private schools are looking for are coachable students who are able to implement and actually take action. And you can gain a lot of those skills through community involvement. Mm. And Michelle, what are some of those meaningful experiences that students can partake in when they're maybe exploring perhaps a gap year or just volunteerism in general? Yeah, on a, on a gap year, there is so much that is possible that isn't possible when you are a full-time student. Because when you are a full-time student, you have the added pressure of the homework and the extracurriculars and the social clubs that you're part of as part of your school. So even the just strict number of hours that are available to you to take on larger projects. 
just aren't there in the same way. Whereas when you're on a gap year and you've created more space in your calendar, in your, in your mind and in your heart and, and more space to work on these projects, instead of spending an afternoon signing up for somebody else's project and picking up garbage or volunteering at a food bank, which are the traditional things that we think of, you can actually take on such a larger piece of that puzzle and really, really flex those leadership muscles and understand the inner workings of of what it takes for our society to tick and move forward. So by giving yourself more space, those opportunities become that much richer. You're not just consuming and, and giving back that tiny little bit in your hours or your manual labor, but you're actually able to evaluate what skills do you have that you can bring to the table and what muscles can you flex and leverage in a completely different way on a completely different, different scale. And you can be available for those daytime meetings that are typically reserved for those who are in the working field or retired. Um, students and young people can have a voice at those tables, whereas when they're in school, they're just not able to, to step into those leadership roles. And on a gap year, that, that just opens the door so much wider to a bigger breadth of opportunities that are out there. Mm, great. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about gap years. Uh, Shane, tell us a little bit more about Count Me In and uh, the way that you work with students because I know you started this project when you were in high school and so it, it, it's evolved tremendously and, and I think according to what Charmaine said you've impacted more than 10 million people in 104 countries so tell us about Count Me In. So Count Me In today is a social entrepreneurship incubator so at Count Me In, we believe that every student has the capacity to make a meaningful impact on their community and on the world. And so we provide direct coaching, immersive workshops. We send speakers to schools, both doing in-service for teachers and also larger keynote sessions for the student body. We uh, run advanced trainings and also produce the annual Global Student Leadership Summit. It's probably what we're best known for around the world. We have alumni across six continents from that program alone. And our goal is simply to prepare students with the behaviors, the skills, the confidence, and all the support that they need to increase that leadership capacity and their achievement in the world. I love, Michelle, the, the wording, the phrasing you chose of exercising and, and building leadership muscles because we look at leadership the exact same way. Leadership is a muscle and if you have ever uh, worked in, in weight training or, or weight loss or done anything remotely advanced in the gym, you know the value of a trainer. You know the value of a coach. If you want to reach your next level in the gym, it's going to be valuable to have those expert level resources and that support system. And that's what Count Me In is all about. So we started early on kind of holding students' hands through finding volunteer opportunities. That's how this all started as a small project back during my freshman year of high school. And now, 12 years later, uh, we've realized many things over the course of the last 12 years, the most important of which being that students today really want to lead their own ventures, their own projects. We have this new generation of young entrepreneurially minded people and they want to go make that impact, but they don't necessarily just want to sign up and show up at that event and, you know, run the bake sale or support and ticket sales or whatever the case may be for that organization. They want to start their own project that connects to the cause. So over the last decade, we have tracked, monitored, and supported more than 30,000 service projects around the world. Our programs have reached students in 104 countries now, and all these projects are student-led, student-driven, and we support them through creating these grassroots initiatives, whether it's a small one-day project or a larger organization. Wow, so impactful. Can you share with us some maybe some concrete examples of what you've seen? You've traveled the globe. Um, some, do you have any stories to share with respect to? Do I have? Examples? I have 30,000 stories. <laughs> Yeah, I'll share a couple concrete ones just to wrap your head around what some of these projects look like and, and the scale, both large and small. Uh, I would say all of them, though, have an incredible impact. And most importantly, they're connecting a cause or a community opportunity with a, a passion or an interest that a student or young person has. So we uh, had a, a young lady in the Midwest of the U.S. decide that they uh, felt some negative emotions whenever they looked at themselves in the mirror and they were working on building up their own self-esteem and realized that 
other young girls like them probably felt the same way. So they decided to write positive messages on all kinds of post-it notes and put them all over the mirrors in every single girl's bathroom. And this idea then spread mm -hmm. to the, the men's bathrooms. And we've seen other schools do something similar with dry erase markers. So just spreading positive messages and rallying the troops to start that kind of local movement in the school. So a small grassroots project, giving back, raising morale, huge impact. On another side of the spectrum, we had a, a young man named Aiden ent entering his senior year of high school out in British Columbia. He was hard of hearing and recognized that there were so many students in his community who were also hard of hearing but couldn't afford hearing aids. And so he learned of a charity that was fundraising to give access to hearing aids to those young people that could not afford that th those products and so he mm. started this benefit concert called rise abby strong and he gathered musicians and young talented artists from across the community and they raised yeah. thousands of dollars uh, and this has since become a larger movement out in abbotsford british columbia so all kinds of different things that students are starting ideas they have whether they're passionate about the environment about health about wellness uh, there are all kinds of things that they can do to make an impact and we're just there to support them at every step of the way to make sure that first and foremost they're turning those dreams and goals into steps so they can take action so they can actually achieve them and of course grow in the process wow so creative so impactful Michelle, tell us more about gap years and uh, perhaps some concrete examples of what students are doing um, in, in terms of making their experiences meaningful. And I think that's an important piece because we see when we speak to U.S. colleges or uh, independent schools, they're looking to ensure that students take their individual characters and passions and match those to those experiences as opposed to padding an application. So what can you tell us about uh, gap years? Yeah, so I think um, it's really interesting this year because we're, we're writing a whole new story about what the gap year is. And for the most part, we're writing a new story for the masses because those who take a gap year have often had local experiences, but in our minds and on Instagram and what makes the newspaper are those larger global experiences where you strap on a backpack and you head off to Africa to save the world and and that narrative that's actually quite destructive um, is not accurate to what the whole gap year experience is all about. So this global pandemic that we have where we're, we're, we're forced to think differently people are looking at their decision right now and they're saying okay I could do this online schooling or I could take a gap year but if I can't travel what the heck am I going to be doing? Because that's in their mind. That's what a gap year is about. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, and has always been, that a gap year is a purposeful step away from your normal routine. So it doesn't have to happen right after grade 12. It can happen at any stage. Uh, for, for, for all the grown-ups out there, it could be a sabbatical. Um, so taking a purposeful step away from your normal routine to work on yourself and how you want to show up in the world. Mm. And so in order to make that purposeful, you have to take some time and do some reflection around who are you as a person? Who do you want to be? What skills do you have? And then how can you connect that with different opportunities that exist? Or as Shane was saying, how do you create your own? There's such a hunger for people saying, this is something I see in my life or in my community. And I have the skills and talents and interests to do something about it. And that's really what, what's out there. So the typical Canadian experience, people historically have only traveled between three, month, three weeks and three months. Um, as, as a general rule, there are some people who will take the entire year to travel, but the vast majority of people spend most of their year domestically. And they do things like finding internships or working in order to save up for school or save up for a larger trip later on in the year. But they're also connecting with things that are important to them. So looking at their own mental and physical well-being. What do they need to do to recharge their battery? 
because so many students are coming out of that pressure cooker of high school where the grades and being on the basketball team and on student council, there's a lot of pressure that's going on. And for the students who want to be successful in post-secondary, they've got to put their best foot forward. And so taking that pause and checking in with themselves and say, what have I been neglecting? about myself that I need to spend a little bit of time on so that I am going to be my best self going forward. And, and that's a great thing to do. It's also a great opportunity to do some exploring. If you're not sure of what you want to be studying in post-secondary, get out there, do some informational interviews, find internships in different areas that you might want to do your career in. Once you get your foot in the door, you might realize that absolutely not. This is not what I thought it was. This is not what I want to do. And there you go. You saved yourself tens of thousands of dollars and years of your life. Um, or you may step in and say, you know what, this, this really lights me up and I'm, I'm on the right track. And, and you can step into your education with more confidence that you've made the right decision. And you've already started to build a network in the field that's going to support you once you've graduated. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the fun elements as well. What are the projects that you want to take on? What skills do you want to develop? Have you been putting off getting your driver's license or your first aid certification? Or um, have you always wanted to learn how to play the accordion or um, fix a car? What are those things that have always just been a curiosity for you that you can spend mm -hmm. some time exploring because those little itches can lead you down such a, a, an exciting pathway and you may explore new areas that are exciting, interesting to you that could either lead to a career or lead to feeling more fulfilled and, and f finding your purpose. Mm, lovely. It feels like we're all in a COVID gap year, doesn't it? <laughs> and. Uh, are you finding that students, have you connected with students, are they deferring their um, academic year? Have they deferred offers to post-secondary institutions to, to take a gap year? Yeah, we're, we're seeing everything all over the map this year. Um, it's really interesting. The traffic to my website is up between 300 and 500% year over year. So people are exploring it, but people are not yet prepared to really make a decision. Because what they're looking at is they're looking at this somewhat known experience of what's coming down the pipeline, that it's going to be an online first semester at the minimum. Um, they're probably not going to have residence. They're probably not going to have fresh week. They're definitely not having those things um, for the first little bit. But then they're looking at the alternative and they're saying, well, what fits in there? What can that do? And so they're, they're really weighing a known with an unknown. And so um, they're not prepared to commit yet. And so they've got to get out there and get exploring and seeing what they're weighing, what options they're weighing so that they can look at comparing apples to apples to make mm -hmm. the right decision for their family because they're, there is no right or wrong decision this year. Um, everything is different. And that's the attitude that we need to take. It's not going to be as we expected. So whether you were planning a travel gap year and that's not possible, or you were planning frosh week and that's not possible, we need to shift our mindset to say, okay, we are, we are in an unprecedented situation and there is so much opportunity in front of us that we just have to pick it up and look at things through different lenses. And, and that's really a powerful place to, to come from. Mm, excellent. Charmaine, over to you. Well, you know, it's, it's so interesting listening to this conversation because uh, mm. Shane and Michelle, you both brought me back to my, to my teenagehood there. <laughs> when, I, when I went to college the first time, I actually went through for something very different than I do now. I was a correctional officer way back when, 4, 11 and 3 quarters and a correctional officer in Ontario. But part of what led me to that is exactly what you both have talked about is me needing to test the waters. I actually did a couple of volunteer jobs. I think it was grade 10 and 11 with a couple of different types of professions. And I found I, I wasn't comfortable there. Um, it, it, it wasn't my joy. And that became very clear when the executive director said to me, are you loving what you do? And I thought, wow, that's a big question for you know, a teenager. How do I answer that? What's the right thing to do? And I, I said, no, I, I feel like I'm 
this isn't my joy. And I am so grateful for that lady for asking that question because I probably would have pursued that career path because it felt more stable, more opportunities. And instead I worked in, in corrections and, and, but that, you know, led me to all these other meaningful experiences. And that's what you're talking about. I had a question for both of you. And then, then I want to go back to some of the questions that we've been asked by parents. How important um, from both of your perspectives is it that when students are gaining volunteer experience or working on projects, a lot of it is, as you said, Shane, it's not a volunteer job per se, it's a movement that students are creating out of their own entrepreneurism. How important is getting letters of recommendation or um, testimonials? How important is that for private school and college university applications? Shane, what's your thoughts on that? It's definitely important, but I, you shouldn't look at it like necessarily checking off a box. I know we all love checklists. Awesome. We want to make sure we're doing all the things, but it's far more important to actually develop relationships. So what, what we have found through our work is that whether or not you're formally signing up to work with an organization or running your own project on the side that per help, uh, perhaps supports a cause, uh, you want to build relationships of people that will support your application, that will jump on the call with that admissions agent, uh, that will speak praises to you and actually has a, a strong idea of what you're like. What are the soft mm -hmm. skills you've developed? What is it that you care about? What are your passions? What are you going to bring to that school? Right? That's We want really a lens inside of you. What makes you mm -hmm. tick? Who are you? Mm -hmm. And if you're just looking to check off that box and get that letter of recommendation, you're probably not putting enough effort into building those relationships. It's one of the, the core concepts that we teach at the Global Student Leadership Summit. So we have these top student leaders from around the world that apply and attend this event every year. And more than half of the program is based on communication skills, confidence, mm. how to build those relationships, how to arrive with authenticity, how to be appropriately vulnerable in those conversations so that you can let people in and really help people understand who you are and bring your full whole self to the table. Okay. That is far more important than any carbon mm -hmm. copy letter of recommendation because if it seems like a copy and pasted document that they send to any student that asks it any admissions person is going to see right through that yeah awesome i, I love and i love that you've talked about the power of relationships and i know joanna will have a comment on that after michelle michelle what's your take on on the same question yeah i would i would echo all of those things and I also think that the storytelling element is so mm. important. Um, and however you can make your story richer is going to, to help you. It's, it's about when you are writing those statements or when you are sitting in those interviews, how can you convey that experience? Not only what did you do, but what did it mean for you and how did you change and how did you impact others? Um, and, and that ability to storytell, if that can be supported by somebody else, um, it's very different. And if, yeah. like as Shane was saying, if they just said, yeah, this person showed up for five hours, that's not a great story. But if they can talk about how they saw you light up when you were interacting with the people they serve, or you took on this extra role that you didn't really have to, um, and that comes through the relationships that you've developed, but in the end, it comes down to storytelling and, and who's telling the best stories and, yeah. and what is the meat behind that story and that authentic, real, not made up meat. Yeah, you know, a couple, a few years ago now, I worked with um, a number of school boards after the Fort McMurray Canada wildfires, and I was working with them uh, and the families and, and teachers around resilience building. And the comment you've just made, Michelle, about um, stories came up so so frequently when I was talking in the schools and in the community. And what one of the people in the workshop said something that just you know, has, is etched in my brain. And she said, stories connect people. And I just, it, when you, when you're in an interview and you feel awkward and stress as you're both entertaining, a story takes you to where you're comfortable. You know that because you lived it and you can talk about it, as you said, Shane, authentically and passionately and with confidence, Michelle. So thank you for raising that because it's also a very powerful life lesson for business, because I know as all of us are entrepreneurs, um, part of how we do our work is telling stories and connecting that way. Joanna, you talk a lot about the importance of relationships and how critical that is in the whole educational system, but certainly in 
um, applications for college, university, and private schools. Anything to add that we've missed on that? Um, what Michelle and, and Shane talked about, I think, says it all. But it, it's always interesting to me when families speak about, you know, the, the, the academic piece that they, um, their students are engaged in, and then the standardized test scores. And what's most important is that application and that interview uh, piece. And some, some students and some parents are always looking at the numbers. So to Shane's point, you know, can I check off this box? How many hours do I need? How many volunteer right. hours to get into an Ivy League college? And that's not the story you want to be telling, right? So um, I think we're all sharing or stating the same message. It's so important to get to those core character traits and make sure that that's well presented in the application so that that's definitely that's, important. That's a great point too, especially with the numbers, because we can get really caught up. And I'm just thinking back to my high school experience. Of course, I was starting this organization at the time, and I think I stopped <laughs> counting after a thousand hours. But yeah. a thousand hours is in many ways meaningless. Like it, no mm -hmm. one cares about the number of hours when you come down to it. It's about the impact. It's about the relationships. It's about how you're mm -hmm. learning and growing and what that story is. And I think that's a great hack that Charmaine touched on, especially for students out there that have trouble with interviews. They find them nerve wracking. How many of us have so much intimidation when we're talking to a group of people, let alone on a stage in front of others. But when you're not trying to present yourself, but instead you're sharing a story, that mm -hmm. small shift in framing can change your entire experience and allow you to flow more, more effortlessly, come across 10 times more confident. Because what are you doing? You're telling a story and we're human beings. We are built on generations of storytellers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Thank that. You. So we're going to dive into some of the nitty gritties now. One of This question has come up to me uh, from parents, educators, guidance counselors, uh, and organizations who actually need volunteers. So it's come up from pretty, and students have asked this question too. So the question is around, and this is for both, uh, both of you, Shane and Michelle, um, where are some of the ways, or where, are, how can a student find a volunteer opportunity where, where they might not be able to sort of go knock on the door of the organization right now and they and they might not be able to show up physically so the question is where can they find some opportunities and the second question would be um, what are some of the opportunities like what are some of the ways that you're seeing young people volunteer so who wants to take that one first <laughs> I can I can jump in okay then. awesome um, I, when I talk about volunteer opportunities, I really look at it in terms of, you can come at it from two different ways. You can look for the organization that you want to support. Um, so you can look at the, all the volunteer websites that have postings that are out there and you can start large, you can start at the national level, you can start at the bottom, you can start very hyper locally, maybe um, a faith community that you belong to or your region. Um, or your city, they all have some sort of listing for, for volunteer opportunities. So you can come at it from that way if you have no idea of where you want to start. You can also come at it from the other side of things and identify what skills and talents you have and then think about who might need those talents and figure out what that, what that marriage might look like. So a really concrete example of this is perhaps you have a, a passion for photography you can get out there and you can use your photography skills and maybe you want to get out there and you want to photograph things that have to do with climate change. And then take those photographs and find a, a climate action group in your area that could use those photos in their, um, in their campaigns or in, in the work that they're doing. So you're actually identifying what skills you have and then finding a, a cause or something that you want to relate to that you could support with. Similarly, if you are into designing websites and that's a skill you have, who might need a website right now or whose website maybe needs a little bit of support? Uh, a lot of small businesses, a lot of small charities could really, really use your support in those ways. So if you have a skill that you could lend to them, then don't be afraid to reach out and, and make that opportunity possible. 
Um, so I think those are some really great ways to approach it. Also, the, at this time this year, um, the federal government is putting together a huge database of volunteer opportunities through the Canada Student Service Grant um, program, uh, which allows students actually to get compensated for their volunteering. So they are looking for 100,000 youth volunteers and they will be compensated between $1,000 and $5,000 towards their higher education, depending on the level of involvement that they're doing. So they're actually matching students with organizations that are looking for opportunities for volunteers. So they're actually going to help make those connections and the bonus is at the end of it, if you meet all the criteria, you're going to get some sort of bursary out of the end of it. So in this year, there's, there's kind of a, a very unique space um, over the summer for this to, to really kickstart some relationships that, that could last longer term after the, the program is finished. You can continue on, um, but that is coming down the pipeline. It was, uh, the application was supposed to launch yesterday, um, but I will have to check and see if it has gone live, but that's a really great resource uh, to get kickstarted. And just I'll say um, the resources for all of you listening, the resources that we're mentioning and the websites that we've mentioned, we'll be happy to put those in the follow up email that comes with the recording because I imagine people are writing notes to themselves right now that they need to go <laughs> check that out. So not to worry, we've got you covered. We'll get those links. Shane, what can you add to this conversation around, you know, where, where can people find opportunities and and, yeah, uh, there are great resources. Do? Michelle named one. We were talking about volunteer.ca earlier. There are lots of places online to find opportunities. What I would stress now is that while it may seem like what, what a, a terrible time to transition, what a difficult time to be graduating high school, what as, as interesting as this time is, it comes with a lot of benefits. And one of them is that all these organizations and companies for that matter, looking for volunteers or interns who have never been set up for or open to remote workers have now been forced to enter this remote working world that we're all in now. So for example, we just brought on a, a new team member at Count Me In who's based in Winnipeg. Uh, she would otherwise have had to be in, in Toronto or Sacramento to work on the project she's on right now, but currently she can work entirely remotely on this project. Uh, and virtually every organization or company has entered this same space now. So I would challenge students out there to think about a, a company or a, a skill or a role that they want to fulfill or they want to work with and seek out people in that industry, people at that organization and reach out, share mm. the skills that you have, share the passion you have for what they're doing or the organization, how long you've been following them, what you might be able to provide, and then ask the question, how can I best support you? You know, I have time on my hands. I would love to contribute to the work you're doing. I'm very passionate about X and, and I'd love to, to help. Please let me know what I can do and how many hours I can support each week. Those kinds of questions, those kinds of emails are not sent as frequently as you might think. That is a mm. student leader. That is someone stepping up having an idea and taking action. Just like we were talking about shining above and beyond that recommendation letter, this is the equivalent of stepping above and beyond that one-click volunteer application. So while you can look on these websites, while you can submit your offer through these general forms, it also speaks volumes when you reach out to the director of volunteer engagement or maybe even the CEO of a smaller organization or company, present yourself offer your, your services to them and see how you can best support them, what they're struggling with right now, where your skills may be able to fill in a gap. That's fantastic. I was talking to a colleague of mine yesterday and, and uh, Natasha works with, her organization is called Needs List in, in Toronto and they do a lot of work in the area of, of um, responding in disasters and helping with disasters that have gone on around the world and so they're now using a platform called onlinevolunteering.org where there's just you know numerous opportunities like you said Shane you don't have to leave home you can do it virtually and and students can kind of pair up what their strengths are uh, I know a couple of years ago we had a student uh, right out of the blue phone it was a, a, a friend of a friend's uh, daughter and uh, had some skills in marketing and and social media and phoned up and said you know do 
any help with this? And as a small business owner, I just thought, yes, you know, this is a great opportunity. I love that. And it, and better than the opportunity, Shane, was just, as you said, that leadership that they, that that young person picked up the phone and had obviously really prepared because, you know, she was able to talk about all the ways she could help. So, yeah. And really so, Maine, what, what about that young man who had the 3D printer at home and then decided to make the, the mask? from one of the private schools uh, that that has been so fun joanna you and i uh you know we keep between the two of us we've been seeing all these innovative projects that students have been working on i think that student was 14 or something and um yeah started 3d printer and started making masks and and i, I loved it saw a problem and created a solution and just took action and boy, oh boy, those are the kind of students that we want working for us down the road. So I just love that innovation and, and uh, putting your foot forward. Joanna, I'll pass it back over to you. Can I jump in with a couple of resources? Oh, yes, first, please. Yes. Um, so a couple of things popped to my mind. I had to take notes because so I, did, I didn't want to forget them. For those who are who, who do see an opportunity in their local community, like the face shields or things mm -hmm. like that, there um, are grants available. They're called the Rising Youth Grants, and they mm -hmm. are offered through the Canadian Service Corps. Um, and those are grants up to $1,500 that young people can get in order to get projects up and off the ground. So if you do identify mm -hmm. something in your local community, definitely tap into that. It's a great um, entrance into grant applications and reporting. It has been simplified because it's designed for youth. So it's, what are you doing? What's it gonna cost? Who are you gonna impact? And the reporting is, what did you do? How much did it cost? And what was the impact? Um, <laughs> so very, very helpful for young people wanting to get into that space. The other thing I wanted to talk about was when we we're talking about online work. There's an incredible resource that was put out through the Canadian Council for Youth Prosperity, and it's a PDF book on working from home for youth. And it talks about all of the things that you need to consider when you are coming um, into the, an online workspace and what do you need to do from an HR perspective? What do you need to do from being efficient at working from home and minimizing distractions? It's got everything under the sun there. So that's a really great resource for people who are just getting into volunteering online or working online. Um, and it's specifically designed for young people in entering. And then the other piece with that online piece where we're talking about where borders and, and distance doesn't matter. There's an organization called Umprakash that actually has people in developing countries that are, are reaching out and asking for support for remote volunteer placements. Mm. Um, and so this is, this is another example of how technology is really opening up the world and giving us opportunities to lend our skills in new ways to people that we may never meet in person, but we can really uh, get out there and, and meet people where they are and, and respond to the asks that they have for support. Great. And we'll put all those resources in the follow-up email. <laughs> I know people are going to say, what was that link? What, how do you spell that? So that we'll get it out to you. Perfect. <laughs> Michelle will get it to us. Charmaine, Joanna, when you were yeah. talking about that PPE, it made me think of another student project that I think might resonate with uh, parents or counselors out there that are working with perhaps some of those higher achieving students that are not gonna just wanna sign up to be a general volunteer at an organization. Uh, we had a, a young student we were working with, Danya, who we are coaching. She's at Redmond High School out near Seattle in Washington State. And uh, she gathered a group of her friends from AP classes and they put together study sheets. And they oh, started what they oh, called cool. Review for Relief. So what they were doing was oh. selling all of these AP study sheets uh, for donations to PPE, and now they're also splitting donations between PPE and and relief for COVID, as well as Black Lives Matter, uh, oh, and they've raised thousands of dollars and helped so many students these past three months study for their AP exams. So here are students oh. that were used to tutoring, who were used to helping others, who then put that passion and excitement together, and all they did was build a website on Wix and they started a really dynamic Instagram profile. That was it, right? Love but they, it. they were putting this out there and I think just these kinds of stories, when we share them with the students in our lives, the teens that we're working with, it might inspire something in them that perhaps they didn't think was even an option. 
right? Mm -hmm. I think there, there's more opportunity than students realize. And sometimes we just need to give them that opportunity for responsibility. Mm -hmm. Michelle was talking about how everything is different. And I agree in many ways, these last few months have been unprecedented, but in many ways, so many of the, of the things that we've seen on the front lines are still the same. Students still wanna be heard. Students still have amazing ideas. Students still have all kinds of leadership capacity and they still crave that sense of responsibility more than anything else. And when we give that budding student leader that sense of responsibility, they start to flourish and take all that they're doing to the next level. Awesome. Nice. So how about some, so parents uh, obviously are looking to build a strong relationship with their, their teenagers or younger. <laughs> I'm finding it's, it's, uh, it's a, an eye awakening experience when I'm, you know, home with three boys who uh, love to be on the computer uh, gaming most of the time. And so how do we as parents help these young future leaders um, and support them with the volunteer virtual experiences that they could be taking advantage of. So parenting, any parenting tips? <laughs> Shane? Yeah, I was actually just, just working with a parent coach uh, earlier this morning, uh, dealing with some of these similar issues. We're always working with parents because if you want to best impact teens, you have to support all the caring adults in their lives. Uh, speaking of which, One Caring Adult is another incredible resource. You can go to onecaringadult.com mm. and, and our team has put together some incredible resources for counselors and teachers and, and uh, anyone who works or lives with teens. Uh, but if you really want to show up and build that more rich relationship with young people in your life, ask questions. Uh, mm. People really want to feel heard. They want to feel listened to. That's human nature, but it's especially true for teenagers. Uh, so when we arrive at a conversation with curiosity and we ask these questions and we show genuine interest, it's going to be a lot more powerful than you perhaps making a suggestion. Uh, same, same thing would be true if you're trying to build rapport around one of their passions. Let's say video games, Joanna. That seems to be the hot topic <laughs> in your household. I've, I've seen this both with parents and teachers. The parent example is you don't understand what your kids are doing on their devices or what video games they're playing. So you ask the question like, what is this? I don't understand Call of Duty or Minecraft or whatever, whatever the game is, right? And that's going to be a really hard starting point because they don't feel understood. Whereas if you arrive at the conversation with at least a base level of information where you can ask a slightly more challenging question where it's like, oh, mom kind of gets this game. Oh, she's asking how I get to level seven or what's the deal with this character. Like you can engage in that conversation and you're both going to have a lot more fun in that conversation too versus a, what is this? The teacher or counselor parallel that I've seen in schools and that I train teachers on in my in-service trainings or PD trainings are the classic example of a teacher setting up the projector to run a PowerPoint or a Kahoot or some kind of digital presentation. And they have a lot of trouble setting up the projector, the technology to kind of put up their hands and say, I don't get this. Hey, you know, Tommy, Jim, Fahad, can you please help me set up this projector? And of course, the student's going to step up and eight seconds flat, they have it all set up and running. And the teachers think that that's great. You know, they're utilizing the student skills, except the conversations in the hallways afterwards mm -hmm. that I've been privy to are, hey, if Miss can't even figure out how to work a projector, there's no way she would understand the bigger things going on in my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because for them, it's so intuitive. Yeah. So when we instead arrive with at least that base level understanding of how to hook in that projector and get it running, then maybe utilize the student skills to make the PowerPoint more engaging or use animations or GIFs, right? Or other, but you're arriving with some foundation of knowledge and asking those deeper questions. That'll open up conversation, build trust, and evolve a relationship to the next level. You're so right. And, and those conversations have been around esports and esport institutions that they might want to pursue down the road. So you're absolutely cool. right. Michelle? Yeah, I would, I would echo all of those things. And I think a great analogy is to show up for your kids in whatever they're interested in, in the way a hockey mom shows up at the arena. That 
when you think about all that goes into supporting a hockey player, you're at the rink for 5 a.m., you're driving them around, you're spending all this money, you're sitting in the stands, you're cheering them on, you're investing in them, and, and, and there's a very outward sign that you value what they're doing. How can you be the hockey mom for Minecraft? How can you be the hockey mom for, um, for a climate change activist? How can you be the hockey mom for somebody who's showing interest in the Black Lives Matter movement? How can you show up for them? How can you cheer them on? How can you show that you're interested and you support them um, and you're trying to understand them? I, I don't know very many hockey moms that, that also put on the pads and get out on the ice at, at five in the morning, but they're showing their support in other ways. So you might not sit down and pick up the controller and, and, and game right alongside them, but how can you be in the stands? What is that for you? Um, and for the, the thing that your young person is excuse me, passionate about, because that's, that's what they want. That's, that's the way that you can be that person for them and you can build that relationship. Oh, thank you. I feel so supported. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Charmaine, over to you. Okay. So uh, the, the, the question I want to focus on now here is around um, student leadership and, and uh, how do we differentiate? Shane, I'll check in with you on this one. What's the number one factor from your perspective that differentiates a successful student from a top achiever? Mm. We have seen this. I can talk about actual metrics and stats that we've seen just out of the Global Student Leadership Summit. So that's the program where we have students apply from around the world. We have alumni in six different continents who have been certified now as, as Count Me and Global Student Leaders. And the difference between those student leaders that are doing really well in their school, but in the larger pond, maybe they would just blend in with the crowd. Those true top 1% top achievers are the ones that are actually able to take action and accomplish any goal they mm -hmm. seek out to accomplish. So the other student leaders have big ideas. Sometimes they'll accomplish some, sometimes their grades are you know, top grades in their school, but they may not actually be able to implement and apply soft skills and hard skills together to achieve a goal they set out to do to create an action plan and take mm -hmm. those steps. So we have seen you know, students come out of our program and reach Ivy League schools become top performing artists, uh, entrepreneurs, starting their own charities, organizations, or companies in their communities. And it's because they not only have that ability to be coached through taking those steps and taking action, but they also have the support system. And that's just as important, right? If you want to take consistent action to get consistent results, you also need a consistent support system in place, which is where our coaches come in. Um, I should also mention if, if that program seems like something that your teen or student in your life would benefit from, please uh, go to countmeinsummit.com slash parents. Even if you're an educator, just go to countmeinsummit.com slash parents. And you can download all kinds of free resources from that page, a prospective parents package, which would probably be a lot of value for you um, if that might be a, a step for a student in your life. Fantastic. And Michelle, um, the, the question I wanted to ask you was, this came from a parent. Um, the parent was asking me, what if my child takes a gap year and never wants to go back to post-secondary? So her, she, she's sort of finding herself, um, how did she word it? She is leading the conversations down the pathway that, because she's, she's very afraid. She says big dreams for her child and her child has big dreams. So how do you respond to that? What, I'm going to give her this recording to listen to, but what, what advice? Because I know there's other parents fearing the same thing. Yeah, I think that fear is, is real. And the statistics show that people who take time off, 81% will return to post-secondary. That, that number is much higher if they're enrolled in a formal gap activity of some kind. So if they're just taking the year to work or just kind of sitting on the couch, they, they make up that 19% that, that yeah. don't make that mm. transition. But if they have a plan and they're very proactive and it's a purposeful year, it swings towards that 90%. Now, every parent is saying, my kid is in that 19%. I know it. They're not going to make it. Um, and actually, if we look at the number of students who drop out out of post-secondary in their first year, depending on which study you look at, mm -hmm. that number floats somewhere between 9 and 14 percent. And although I don't have any statistical data to make that correlation, 
Um, for those who post-secondary is, is in their veins, it's in their, their path, it's something that, that they will be successful at, they will find their way there. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not meant for them, then forcing them into it. I talk to so many parents when their kid has dropped out of first year because they weren't ready. They weren't in the right space. They didn't have the right maturity. They didn't have the right drive to, to be in it for the right reasons. And they mm -hmm. come to me at a deficit. They feel like a failure. Whereas mm -hmm. if they had proactively taken that time to gain the maturity, to gain the skills, to gain the focus for which program is a best or school is a best fit for them, then they're going to be tackling it in a different way. So mm -hmm. I think as long as you're purposeful and intentional with your time and you talk about the expectation, I think that that, that is a really healthy way to approach it. And I don't think it's something to be feared. Mm -hmm. One of the right. one of my podcast episodes um, that I'm going to be releasing in the next little bit, um, this young woman took a gap year and she didn't go back. But you know what? She got a job in a, a tech field. She is making more money than I make. She is so lit up by the work that she does. And she is, she's got an apartment in Toronto and she's living on her own and she is living her best life. And she said that university is still on her radar when it makes sense for her. Right, but right. right now she is achieving her life goals and she's going to be ready to step into that when it fits her. But right now she is doing just fine um, with, without making that transition. So even in that 19% that don't make yeah. that transition, it doesn't mean they're still sitting on mom and dad's couch. Um, yeah. It yeah. means that they are, they are finding their own way. And us as parents, we need to be able to be uncomfortable or be comfortable mm -hmm. in the discomfort. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a yeah. place we want to launch our kids in a very mm -hmm. successful way. And that means they need to get into the driver's seat of their lives and we need to, to be their co-pilot and in the passenger seat. But, uh, yeah. but we need to make sure that they're equipping themselves with those skills to make those decisions. Well, Charlene, I yeah. can I just sing Michelle's praises for a moment? Yeah. Because the, the, there's so much power in the, the Canadian Gap Year Association, Count Me and other organizations, the, mm. the true value is offering the system and the structure that mm. allows these students to truly thrive. And it's something that we all need in our lives. I'm sure some of you who may have started your remote working position uh, a few months ago in your pajamas, uh, you know, because no one can see you, you're not wearing pants, right? <laughs> we started to realize that that was not sustainable. We did not like that feeling of spending every single day in our pajamas or without pants on, mm -hmm. as, as freeing as it can be. We need structure, we need systems, and students thrive with them. So I would dive deeper into that 81% number, and I would venture to guess that 100%, if not very close to 100% of that 81%, were in a structured program that had guides along the way, that had coaching, that had systems. Same with the Count Me In Summit and the curriculum that we provide. There are checkpoints along the way. You have a coach, an accountability partner, right? There are systems in place that allow these students to reach that next level, which in many ways they could never do on their own. And that's why it's amazing that programs like the Canadian Gap Year Association exist for these students. Yeah. They're things that we should all be taking advantage of. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautifully said. Well, the work that the two of you and the work that Joanna and her team at Prep Skills do is so important for helping students find their future. And their future will be different and change. I mean, when I was 16, I wanted to be a correctional officer. If you ask me now, if I wanted to go back to that career where I was 10 years. Do you, Charmaine, no. do you want to go back to that? <laughs> no, because I love what I'm doing now. So we change, we evolve. You both have, Joanna has, and I love how you're talking about the tools to find their future. So I'm going to give you a heads up that we're going to, in just a moment, I'm going to ask the three of you your one word or one sentence tip. And I just want to show... Um, on the screen where you can get in touch with our incredible guests Shane and Michelle and we will put this information in the email that goes out but please do reach out to Shane and Michelle they're doing some incredible work with students and families and this is their websites 
and we'll put that in the handouts. And coming up on our Wednesday webinars next week, Joanna will be talking about the U.S. college admissions process. And you'll put your seatbelts on. There's going to be some great information there for families and guidance counselors. On the 27th, there's a webinar for those students that are interested in the pathway to medicine, optometry, or pharmacy. And that is a webinar that is being hosted with MCPHS. And July 8th, we're talking all things standardized tests, applications, EQ skills, private school admissions. And Joanna can speak to this, but September 19th, we hope you'll join us for Virtual Prep Connect. And Joanna, did you want to say a few words about that? We're basically going to continue the conversation regarding private school admissions. And um, I think that the theme of today, building relationships with student parent ambassadors in private schools so that you can find a good fit. Beautiful. And then Joanna and her team are always available. If there's questions that are coming up about the application processes, preparing for testing, helping your child find their future, or if you're a student, helping yourself find your future, you can book a call with Joanna. This is the call link here, and it will be in your uh, post notes as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm always sad when this ends. <laughs> it's almost ending, but I do want to ask the three of you your one word or one sentence tip that you can leave families, educators, students, and counselors with today. Joanne, I'm going to start with you. What's your one word or one sentence tip? You know, I think I'm going to borrow from Mark Twain and the two most important days uh, of anyone's life really is the day that you were born and the day that you figure out why. So I'll leave you with that. Nice. <laughs> Michelle, what's your one word or one sentence tip? Uh, if I had to boil it down to one word, uh, I'm going to use the word permission. I am giving you permission to do what is right for you this year. Um, and, and throw out the expectations of what could have been, should have been, would have been, um, what you were thought it would be. Um, and I give you permission to chart your own course, whatever that looks like this year. Nice. Thank you. Wonderful. Shane. Thank you. All right, Charmaine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one for students and one for caring adults. Is that, is that fair? Well, yes. Joanna breaks the rules on that, so I have to let you know. That yes. Sounds good. Do it. Uh, <laughs> For students, especially those high achievers, consistent results only come from consistent action. Mm. And for parents, counselors, teachers, anyone out there supporting our young leaders, please remind yourselves frequently that you don't need to light yourself on fire to keep them warm. Make sure you're mm. practicing self-care. Self-care is not selfish. It is needed if you want to consistently support them. Nice. Wow. Thank you. So before we thank our guests, there was a question, when will the email with all these juicy links and tips and how to get a hold of you all, um, that will be sent out with the recording in the next couple of days. But you know, I know that people want these quickly. So I'm going to go into the Prep Skills Facebook and Twitter, and I will post those links there. I will take responsibility for that today, so you won't have to wait. And I'm going to end off with my tip that I started with, which was the quote by George Caros, who says, engagement is what you can do for your students, and empowerment is what your students can do for yourself themselves. Thank you, Shane and Michelle, for being here today. Thank you all for joining us live, and for those of you that are watching this recording later, Thank you for taking the time. And Joanna, as always, I look forward to Wednesdays. I love Wednesdays with Joanna. So thank you for having me as a part of this with you. Thank you, Shomane. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Shane. We'll see you soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Bye.